Speed next stream, it's okay. Let's scale in. The radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this Saturday afternoon. I, I apologize, I know there's been some confusion about the hour. Some of you thought it was going to be at 2 p.m. and the email said 3 p.m. and uh, some uh, confusion there. It's all my fault, so uh, don't worry about it. I I screwed up, um, uh, so I apologize. I apologize for that. Uh, I think I set up the YouTube uh, for 2 p.m., but actually uh, everything else was at 3 p.m. So anyway, here we are. It's uh, it's uh, 3 p.m. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a panel, and uh, they will they will do a first round of questions. Super chat is open, so you guys uh, that are not on the panel can ask questions on the super chat. Uh, as always, uh, let's see for some reason. All right, hopefully that'll get better. All right, before we get started, uh, I have a, a a quick announcement. I'll probably repeat it later on in the show when there are more people on. Um, a quick announcement. So I will be, uh, I've been teasing this for a while and maybe some of you have guessed, um, but uh, I've been asked by uh, the Peterson Academy. This is Jordan Peterson's new online. I don't know if it's a university. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's basically online courses uh, that are canned and, and you, you buy, you, ultimately you'll be able to buy a subscription and you'll be able to watch all these courses. It'll be a monthly subscription, and there'll be a lot of these. Anyway, I've been asked by uh, Peterson to um, uh, to do a uh, to do a class, uh, and um, in in negotiating the class and negotiating what I would do, I, I landed up proposing uh, making two proposals, uh, and they landed up accepting both of them. So I will actually be uh, doing. Uh, two classes uh, for Jordan Peterson, one on the nature of capitalism. So so one on the nature of capitalism. Now these classes are eight hours long or eight seg sections, uh, eight sections, about an hour each. Uh, so I'll be doing one on, uh, on finance and uh, one on capitalism. So one on the nature of capitalism, one on the, I can't show you the exact title, but it's something like morality and uh functioning of finance something like that they're eight hours long they are uh taped at a studio with uh so they're the very high quality production value i've seen some samples um and um uh you know uh uh i've seen some samples and uh the production values are very very high uh, and so I'm looking forward to this. It should be a lot of fun. So I go to Miami and I tape these things in Miami. Now, the reason I'm telling you this partially is that there is a live audience uh, during the taping. That is, there's kind of a classroom set up and you're speaking in, in kind of a, almost like a green room setting. And uh, we're looking for people to be in the live audience while it's being taped. Uh, so, there's an application you can fill out. It's at petersonacademy.com slash brook. petersonacademy.com slash brook. And you can go there and you can uh, you can actually, I'm putting the uh, URL in the chat, and you can uh, apply to be in the audience. It doesn't go to me, it goes to them, and they get to decide. You have to be 18 years old there. You have to... Uh, you have to, uh, you know, take care of your own food, accommodation, travel, all of this. Um, anyway, uh, it's it's April thirtieth to May second is the is the capitalism one. Uh, later in May it will be the finance one, and there'll be a separate application for that. April thirtieth to May second, 
uh, from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. So we're taping one hour, short break, another hour, short break, another hour. So it's it's right in the row. And um, uh, again, Miami, Florida, April 30th, May 2nd, 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. I don't know if you have to commit to coming to all three days or you can just come to one day or whatever, what you actually uh, can do. I have no idea how that works, but uh, feel free to um, apply. And it would be great to have some friendly faces in the audience. Uh, otherwise, it'll be kind of the Jordan, the Peterson people uh, who come to all the other courses that are being done there. Uh, but this is, I, I think, exciting. It's going to be fun. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing two of these. And it'll be great if, like, every year I do a few courses for them. Maybe we we can actually get a course on objectivism at some point or, or stuff like that. And, um, again, very high quality. An audience I probably don't reach typically. So hopefully it'll have an impact on this show in terms of growing the show and um, and everything else. Um, <laughs> Maximus says, does he know how much you hate him? I mean, I... I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I, if people do, I mean, if people watch my stuff and uh, at least the person I negotiated this deal with and and uh, the invitation did come directly for Jordan Peterson. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. Um, and uh, the idea, I think, for him is to build uh, a, a kind of a platform with people from all. I, I mean, I asked, is this just going to be all right wingers or whatever and uh because then I'm, I'm less interested in the and the idea was no this is a a, a a wide spectrum of of people and they're trying to get people from a, a, a wide variety of perspectives my guess is some people will turn them down uh but uh but so it's not going to be just jordan peterson like people it's going to be a wide variety of people i think i mean we'll see We'll see how it goes. We'll see what it's like. We'll see what the platform it hasn't launched yet. You can go to Jordan, you can go to petersonacademy.com and see what they have as just the, the landing page there, uh, just as an intro. And uh, but it would be great if those of you, if you live in Southern Florida and you'd like to come uh, or whatever, if you'd like to visit and come, it would be great uh, to have you there. It would be uh, a lot of uh, fun. This is a this is going to be a great way. They haven't no limitations of what I say. So I, I, I'm going to present capitalism from the perspective of Ayn Rand. I'll present finance from my perspective, which is, a, I think, an objectivist perspective. Uh, and uh, morality, I will talk about morality. I'll talk about self-interest. We'll talk about the history of capitalism. What is capitalism? The nature of capitalism. They're both uh, every aspect of this. So I am super excited about it. I, you know, uh, I'm doing this debate on the Israeli-Palestinian thing tomorrow. Once that's over, I'm really dedicating, other than the shows uh, and all my lecturing in Latin America, the rest of the space in my brain, whatever's left over, hopefully uh, a significant amount will be dedicated to preparing for the uh, for the capitalism uh, for the capitalism talk. And then once that's over, I'll start preparing for the uh, for the finance talk. So. Um, uh, I'm excited about that. Tomorrow's debate will not be live. It's taped and it will be released by Robert Breedlove. Breedlove is his name. He is a uh, podcaster, Bitcoin guy, and he'll release it, I guess, when he's ready. So I'm not sure when, probably fairly quickly, but within a week, it be my guess, but it will be released somewhere. Um, all right, what else? I think that is it for now. I'll fill you in more as I learn more, and again, it would be great if you guys, if some of you guys applied for this and uh, and uh, could uh, could come. So uh, yeah, a good good string of events. Uh, uh, I said Milay is coming to our conference and I'm doing this and hopefully all of that will result, the net result of that will be more exposure to a wider variety of people, which is, uh, which is my goal. Uh, I'm not about to convince Millet, and I'm not about to convince um, Jordan Peterson, but I do want access to people, to new people. All right, let's get rolling. Um, we will uh, we will start. I think everybody knows how this works. Uh, we've got a few newbies on the uh, on the panel today, which is always uh, always fun. Um, and we're actually going to start with one of them. Uh, so because Jackson was on first, so uh, Jackson, you get to ask. 
the uh, first question. Okay, lots of pressure. Um, all right, so, so the question I have, and I've, I've been thinking about this a little bit lately, but on one of your shows you were on a few weeks ago, and I think it might have been the show um, about where our rights come from, and you were playing a clip from uh, Bishop Robert Barron about, uh, and uh, another woman from a, a media site who was talking about whether they come from God or come from the government and how both yep. of those are wrong. Um, I think you may have mentioned something about the golden age of Islam. Um, when there was a, a period of Islam, I think maybe like in the 13th or 14th century, where there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of progression of, of knowledge and, and science and reason. And this was sort of based off of similar principles as to what happened in, during the Renaissance when the, the Western Europeans rediscovered uh, Aristotle and the Greeks. Um, and I was curious about that because I wondered if that, and I know a, a little bit about the history of the Golden Age of Islam, but not too much. And I wonder if that could serve as a good roadmap for people to, uh, a context for people to um, evaluate what is happening now in our society and how uh, our politicians and the culture are sort of uh, increasingly using religion as almost a, uh, you know, somewhat authoritarian tool yeah. to tell us how we should live. And it, it seems like it stems from um, two things, maybe I, I would say fear and lack of self-esteem um, but nonetheless, how the danger of how something that might seem benevolent in our society can actually increasingly lead to a situation where it becomes a serious threat to human life. Um, and I guess, you know, going off of that, this is kind of tangential to it, but um, I was I was reading uh, Philosophical Detection the other day, Ayn Rand's essay, and yep. I sort of, you know, made this connection where she was talking about philosophies as systems of rationalization and um, how, you know, self-abasement as a form of evasion. And it kind of came to me, she was talking about it in the form of altruism, but it seemed to me, you know, I was like, well, Christianity is a system of, of self, basically the whole, its whole, its whole premise is self-abasement. Yep. And the conclusion I kind of come to is it seems like it's primarily based off of fear and um, leads to a lack of self-esteem because of the self-abasement. And it seems like that might play into the the trend in authoritarianism that we see going on, uh, you know, in the Republican Party to, a, a, I guess, not to a small extent, but, you know, in, the, in our in what in America, it's to a lesser extent than it is in other places, but it's still going on nonetheless. Yep. Um, and I want to I wonder if you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the, the Christianity, basically, because of its self-abasement, its its uh, emphasis on humility, uh, its emphasis on original sin. Uh, I mean, we're all sinful. We're, we're all inherently, in a sense, bad. So the, there is definitely this sense of this difficulty in gaining self-esteem when uh, you start from the premise that you are already sinful by birth. And where humility, and humility here doesn't just mean not being a bagot, but it means humility. It means an understanding of how worthless and how uh, a, a lack of how, how little you know about the world and how uh, don't don't trust your own mind and don't trust your own ability. Um, how how bad that is, how, how extensive that is. That makes really self esteem impossible. So it's absolutely right. There's no question in my mind that it is Christianity at the core that drives, that is driving us towards uh, authoritarianism, particularly in the United States. But it's, I wouldn't say, you you can't start with the premise that it's fear. Uh, it, I mean, the the beginning is always philosophical. The, the beginning is always ideas. And I would say that the ideas that generate the fear, the ideas that have led us to the point where Christianity has, 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 this kind of impact on us in spite of the fact of how secular our culture was and is to some extent, uh, are the ideas of, of Kant and the idea of the German romantics and the ideas of the philosophers of the, of the 19th to 20th century, all the way up to the postmoderns and analytics and all the way to today. Those ideas basically told people, emphasized to people how impotent reason really was, how reason didn't really connect them to reality, how, and and at the end, that made them dependent on their own on emotion, uh, dependent on um, uh, on emotion, and therefore on others. 
uh, and that led to that leads to the fears. It's always bad ideas that, in this case, crowd out good ideas, the ideas of the Enlightenment, including but, Christianity, though, right, your own? Yes, and you say well, bad Christianity ideas. is a, yeah, but Christianity is such an impotent set of ideas. That is, Christianity is not a powerful set of ideas. Christianity has been debunked. It's been ridiculed. It was marginalized. The Enlightenment basically marginalized it. In Europe, a significant percentage of the population became atheist. I, I mean, Christianity is not a serious threat. But Kant is, and Hegel is, and, and the philosophers are. And I think, I think that... People are turning to Christianity, back to Christianity, because of the default of philosophy, but it's the failure of philosophy that is driving where we are, not the power of Christianity. The power of Christianity was, was thoroughly thrashed during the 17th and 18th century, not as thoroughly as it should have been, not as thoroughly as Ayn Rand ultimately, uh, but it was, and that's why Europe became so secular. But in its place, in the place of Christianity, rose very powerful secular ideas that are just as evil, just as bad, and that have now opened up space for Christianity to make a comeback. Um, now, in terms of the golden age of Islam, I'll just say, which is a big topic, but I'll say, I don't know if that's the parallel we really want to use because people feel alienated from that, partially because it's Islam it's a different culture. And also because Islam never had an enlightenment. They, they, they had, they had, a, they had the, a, a renaissance in a sense. They had, although not really, not in the aesthetic realm, only in the kind of philosophical realm. They had this period in the golden age where they had science and they had philosophy. And they had this debate between reason and, uh, re between reason and, and faith. And, and that mimics what happened in the Catholic Church, you know, several hundred years later. Uh, and, and that debate, I think, was ultimately decided on the side of faith. I think it's hard for people to relate to that. that there are lots of Christians who want to deny that it even existed. Uh, and and uh, I think a better example is the fall of Rome. Uh, you had a thriving, successful uh, uh, culture, uh, uh, culture of Greece that had impacted Rome, in the early uh, uh, centuries of Rome, there was still science, there was still there was still great arts, there was a thriving culture, there was a, 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 a you know a, a, an empire that still had technology and and still had a very positive view. I mean, there were, there were problems. It was, after all, a dictatorship and an empire, not exactly a a, a freedom loving place. But as Christianity comes to dominate the Roman Empire more and more, the Roman Empire sinks and, and ultimately disappears into a dark ages. And I think that, and this is the book, which I highly recommend, The Closing of the Western Mind, documents this really thoroughly. So uh, that, to me, is the better parallel than the Golden Age. Um, and, um, you know, the Golden Age of Islam partially really, uh, you know, the, the last remnant of it only ended when the Christians kind of basically uh, uh, conquered it, right? The, the, the remnants of the Golden Age of, of Islam were in Spain in the, uh, 14, uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries, and by the 15th century, end of the 15th century, basically uh, the Christians had taken over all of Spain, and 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 uh, the, the go the, they, the now the Golden Age was moving from Islam to the Christian world. Uh, anyway, that's that's a kind of a, a, a quick answer. You, you know, the golden age of Islam in and of itself is a big topic and a, and a fascinating one. Okay. Yeah, I have the, the closing of the Western mind on my reading list, but uh, Good. yeah, I added that when I, I heard you mention that book and it sounds very interesting. So maybe yeah. I'll, I'll move that up to the top of my list. Yeah, and then the next one after that is the reopening of the Western mind and that that I'm in the middle of. I took a break from that to, to read some other stuff, but I'm, I'm going to go back to that soon. Uh, but that, the reopening of the Western mind, which is kind of leading up to the Renaissance, leading to the Renaissance and then the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. So, um, uh, so the, those two books are highly recommended. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jackson. All right. Andrew. Ron, you, you've been talking about the, uh, 
Well, in the last show on the Israeli conflict, long show you did, Israeli Gazan conflict with um, Joe Rogan and the culture of stupidity. I wanted to, so I have a formulation. I want to see what you think about it, about altruism's role with stupidity. Mm. That altruism's demand to favor the weak is a mistake that has severe consequences. The strong can be and often is strong because it's good. And the weak can be and often is weak because it's bad. Favoring the weak thus often means favoring the morally bad and severely distorts a person's moral judgments to the point of stupidity. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, um, um, the strong here doesn't just mean physically strong or militarily strong. It means successful, rich, uh, productive, uh, able, smart, scientifically advanced. Um, and uh, those are all disfavored by altruism. Those are all rejected by altruism in favor of the weak. We see that with the math curriculum I talked about yesterday in California. In, or, in order to, uh, altruism demands that in order to favor the, we must not only favor the, uh, the weak students of mathematics, the not so smart ones, uh, but we must also cripple the smart ones so that they don't express their smartness. They don't ex express how they are yeah. bad in, in mathematics and everybody else. And that's exactly what does that do? I mean, that creates a, a culture of people who are stupid in math because even the smart people don't get to be smart in math. They're being suppressed. And that's all altruism. Uh, so absolutely, I think that's a good formulation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Alexander. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, you're fine. All right. Perfect. I have more of a kind of a future-based question. Okay. So the Ayn Rand lexicon. So the book was published in 1988, and it appears that more and more articles and content and definitions have been added, especially on the ARI's website. And I was wondering if there are any plans to expand the lexicon and maybe republish a new version of it, maybe even include some of Leonard Peikoff's ideas in it. And um, also, I do not know how a dictionary style book um, would translate into being an audio book as well. But have you heard anything about that <laughs> or can you elaborate on any yeah. of that? So I, I don't know. I doubt that the lexicon will ever be expanded significantly beyond maybe some uh, work of Leonard Peikoff. I mean, it is a lexicon of objectivism, i.e. Ayn Rand. So any expansion would require change in the, in the way it's being described. I, I can imagine another lexicon being created that is of the, uh, uh, the broader set of, uh, of materials. There wouldn't be an objectivist lexicon, but it would be described some other way. Uh, so that could be interesting. There is a glossary for objectivism, which includes a lot of definitions. So if you Google glossary for objectivism, I think you'll find, I, I think, um, I think uh, um, uh, Harry Binswanger's wife uh, has something like that, put something like that and put it up. In terms of an audio book, I just don't think it would work. So I doubt that it would be there. And, and I don't think it's that valuable because the reality is with something that involves definition-like content, you need to really read it and, and you need to slow down when you do it. Just to say a definition, it just goes by too fast and you can't really do much with it. Uh, so uh, I value the lexicon. I value any kind of dictionary type thing for objectivism. Um, very much, but I need it in front of me. I need to be able to look at it, read it. I need to be able to be at that pace. And I think if it was spoken, it would just go over the top of my head. It would be hard to retain and would, would be less valuable. And then the same kind of question, ominous parallels, any plans on turning it into an audiobook? Because there is no audiobook for that one. I'd love to listen to that one. Yeah, me too. God, uh, I didn't realize that. Um, I mean, that is completely in the control of Leonard Peikoff. Okay. But um, I know that he wants to promote it more. Last time I talked to him, 
So I, I didn't realize there was no audiobook. So yes, audiobook would be one way in which to really promote it. Let me uh, look into that and see what we can do. Um, I, I would love to have an audiobook of uh, Ominous Parallels. I think it would be, I think it would sell well. I think it would be, uh, it, it's so relevant right now. It would be, mm -hmm. it, it, it would be, I think there'd be a lot of people interested in renewing uh, or discovering uh, that book. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. Adam. You're muted. There you go. Okay. I just unmuted myself. Um, just something I wanted to mention first, which is um, you mentioned a student of objectivism whom you met in Amsterdam who comes from uh, Ramallah in the West Bank. Yeah, I made a mistake. Uh, I made a mistake. She's not from Ramala. She emailed me to tell me I made a mistake. She's from Ramle, and Ramle is not in the West Bank. Ramle is an Arab town inside Israel. So she still comes from an Arab family, but an Arab Israeli family, not a West Bank family. So I my error, I was I was going to correct it. I got an email from her. Um uh she's still just as courageous because it's still tricky. Uh, to be an objectivist in that community, but not quite as tricky as it would be if she was in the West Bank. Okay, I wanted to uh, mention that Intel, and I understand that she works mm -hmm. at Intel in Israel, Yep. Uh, because of America's unfortunate limits on legal immigration, Intel opened a third lab after the U.S. and Israel in Poland. And they already have scientists and engineers from 40 countries yep. in that lab. Poland has the immigration policy that you advocate, namely, if someone has a job offer in Poland, they get a visa. Yep. And uh, so now, uh, if it takes too long to get a U.S. visa, um, she can probably go to um, Intel in Poland. Sure. Um, and um, she wouldn't face any of the potential problems that she would have coming from Israel directly. I'll 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 tell her that. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to add that even though Poland is very much divided between fifth almost 50-50 between a theocratic major party and a secular major party. Yep. In terms of economics, both of them are mostly classical liberal, or what is called in Europe neoliberal. Yep. Um, and they've had the fastest economic growth in Europe for three decades now. And according to some observers, they are going to go in terms of uh, median um, disposable house household income. Disposable means that you subtract uh, government spending from the gross domestic product uh, before you allocate it to households. Yep. Um, and that is a very good measure, especially when uh, adjusted for cost of living, which reflects such things as cronyism, corruption, subsidies, tariffs. Um, so I think it's a very good economic measure of how well an, an economy is doing. And Poland is due to overtake the United Kingdom 
within the next few years, they're heading in that direction. They've the question, also the question. Yeah. So I guess the question for you um, is that are we passing uh, Poland and other places with a good philosophy of education uh, in the opposite direction with more and more Americans uh, being in the generations disminded by the Comprachicos? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the United States is in decline. There's no question about that. And uh, it's a decline in many, many parameters. It's decline economically, all driven, I think, by a a rotten educational system, a, a educational system, uh, a progressive educational system really created and gifted to this country by by Dewey and, and his followers, the progressives. Um, I don't see enough of a backlash or enough of a, a, a shift. If anything, they're getting crazier. You can see that really in um, in the kind of stuff that I talked about yesterday about the the math some of the math education in some places in California um the um so so yes there, there are countries around the world that are freer that have better educational systems you know I hope Poland continues on the track that it's on uh, it it certainly has extraordinary rate of economic growth even on a per cap per capita basis and uh, particularly for a European country. And it will overtake the UK. I mean, the UK partially is in a recession and decline, but Poland could, over, could overtake Germany uh, at the rate it's going. And um, it, it, you know, it, it, and part of that is the educational system. I worry about Poland because of the dominance of Catholicism, and as you said, there's a fifty percent theocratic, fifty percent kind of secular, and without a good philosophy, without better ideas and with the pressure of kind of the 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 bad ideas from Europe, the pressure of bad ideas from the US, will they be able to resist the bad ideas? I hope so. Uh, so far, so good. Um, and of course, the more recently, the, the secular political party won the election in Poland. Uh, so, you know, we'll see. I, but Poland does seem like it's on the right track. The Czech Republic is another place in Europe which is relatively on the right track, uh, probably not as good as Poland, but uh, these are Eastern European countries that learned the right lesson from the fall of communism and have implemented kind of, I think, more enlightenment ideas. Uh, che the Czech Republic is completely secular. There's no religion there at all. Um, Poland's still battling its Catholic past, and it struggles because it's also got this connection with uh, you know, the Pope, uh, the Polish Pope who came to Poland and is credited rightly or wrongly with a lot of the resistance to communism. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, 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 I mean, America is in deep, deep trouble. And uh, it's uh, it's good to see that other countries are in better shape and that they're heading in the right direction. And maybe they will influence us rather than us influence them. But to to influence us, they will have we'll have to have more open immigration because we need them to emigrate here in order to help influence our culture. Thanks, Adam. Uh, let's see, Steve. I guess continuing with uh, religion. So I finished the book Christendom, and one of the things that was really interesting is how malleable Catholicism has been over over this even over the, the span of the book. I was wondering what, like, in some ways, it makes it so much easier for them to like roll into like any new country and they can kind of like tweak it yep. um, for the local populace. And it seems like in spreading objectivism, this is a much more difficult problem because we don't have that luxury. And there's we, we we've got reality. We're kind of stuck with reality. It's like. <laughs> I wish I sure your optimism on people being so in tune with reality. Um, but I guess, like, like, how do you think about that? Because in some ways, it's just it seems so much such a much larger problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, one of the things that comes out of Christendom 
is this idea that that and th- and that only that ends at like 1200 1300 whereas it, it, christianity only becomes even more malleable as you go further into the future and and look at look at the pope today declaring gay marriage is okay and all kind you know he he would have been burnt at the stake not that long ago for for just suggesting that never mind uh, actually saying it so christianity is completely malleable because it's a completely subjectivist religion because uh, it, it it is like all religion. It relies on some kind of contact and communion with a being that doesn't exist. And therefore, you can make up whatever you want in terms of what that being is actually telling you, or how, which means how to interpret the holy books and what they mean and what they imply. And one of the things that I think closing of the uh, modern mind, closing of the Western mind uh, makes a point up is how important it is that Paul basically, and, and I think Christendom does as well, maybe another book. No, uh, 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 Dominion has this too, because Dominion, the whole book is like Christianity, it's everything. Christianity is in, in everything. He makes the case that Paul basically says Christianity is in the heart of man. So anything's in your heart is Christianity. Anything that you feel is Christianity. And as long as it's consistent with the, with your emotion, so it can be anything. And in Christendom, he makes the case that when it comes to the UK, to the Britain, it morphs in order to adapt to a um, a warrior uh, culture, uh, and uh, in order to to adapt to them, then suddenly war is okay, and suddenly a god is on your side in a war, which is. Constantine has a little bit of that, but then it really embeds it in in this knights culture, uh, all these knights fighting for God, uh, where I, I think only Christians would be horrified by that idea. So now, what about ob- objectivism? Uh, no, of course, objectivism cannot do that. And and objectivism is uh, oriented towards reality and facts, and and it will only spread, it will only gain influence, it will only advance among people and to the extent people respect reality, facts and logic and reason. And and it just it just won't happen otherwise. Now that's not to say that you know people will interpret certain aspects of objectivism differently here and there and 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 there will be all kinds of um I mean, it's happening today. We've got all these other institutions that interpret objectivism in kind of bizarre ways. I just saw, I just saw a video where the CEO of the Atlas Society was asked about religion and Christianity, and she said something like, "Well, look, you can read Ayn Rand and take what you want from it, and discard what you what you don't like from it. And you can just you just take the stuff you like, and and that's kind of like the old the New Testament. You you know, take the New Testament, take what you like, that discard. I mean, that's not objectivism." But people are going to do that, right? Um, so you'll have all kinds of things like that. But no, objectivism in the end is one set of ideas. It won't expand. It won't grow until people respect facts, reality, reason. And it's going to take a long time because uh, it, that's really hard and really hard, particularly in a culture that's been softened up by religion, by emotionalism, by whatever you know you do what you feel like doing so yeah it's it's gonna it's hard i mean i see that just in ordinary discussions right you argue with somebody you probably all have this experience right you debate somebody and you you, you've got facts and you're showing evidence and it doesn't penetrate it doesn't go anyway (laughs) and you're like it's hopeless and there's a sense in which it's hopeless it's hopeless to convince people who won't accept reality of anything about objectivism, move on. Um, You've got to find those who do. And hopefully over time, more and more people will be willing to embrace reality and reason. Um, They did for a while during the 18th century, the intellectuals at least. And uh, we need another period like that. We need a a new enlightenment, this time guided by objectivism. Thanks, Steve. Skyla. Greetings. Good afternoon, sir. Salute. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you as well. It's good to see the panel. Um, my question regards uh, Ayn Rand's, I think it was an essay, The Age of Envy. It was written, I think, in 1971. Yep. 
And to what extent are we still in an age of envy and how worse or how better have we gotten since she wrote those words? Wow. I mean, it's hard to think that we've gotten better and it definitely seems like we've gotten worse, right? The ideology of envy, which I think ultimately is egalitarianism, that's the ultimate in envy, is bigger today than it was back then in terms of its influence on on the world. Um, I, I I think so. I think what I think in that sense we're we're much worse. That is philosophically we're worse. You can look at both the conservative movement and the uh, left as much worse. Both infected by this idea of envy. Um, the left has taken it to consistently to this idea of egalitarianism. The, the implementation of that idea, uh, you call it woke culture, uh, however you want to call it, uh, is just about the most horrific that one can imagine in terms of a, a, a set of ideas and how they implement it. It is the Kami Rouge. They just don't have the power. They don't have the guns, but that's what they would do if they had it. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 sadly, I think it's much worse. And, and there's a lot we need to do. There's a lot of work to do to fight against that. I also think the good people is bigger, but the culture I think is worse. We're richer. We've gone through periods where envy seemed to have lost some of its. So if you'd asked me in the nineties, I would have said, Oh, we're much better. But what was in a sense going on in the nineties is in the background, all these university professors were building the case. We're taking envy and taking it, taking the ideas to the next level. And all of that really got manifest in the 2000s, certainly in the 20 teens. And, and, and it's all over the place today. So, yeah, sadly. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Robert. Yeah, I was wondering, I'm curious if you've heard the latest uh, Sam Harris. He's, he's back on Free Will with Robert Sapolsky. It was an interesting episode because toward the end, they raised some of their own challenges. You know, they spent 45 minutes, an hour talking about there is no free will. And then toward the end, they said, well, you know, raising children, for example, leads to some problems because, you know, merit is out. Nobody deserves anything. You're born with all your attributes or circumstances force you into your situations. Pride is out. But, you know, if you're going to raise kids, how do you get them to be ambitious and capitalize on their so-called gifts but without isn't telling them. Out? Isn't ambition out? Well, they don't want ambition. It's funny. Even the idea of wanting something is ridiculous if you yeah. don't believe in free will. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious if you heard that latest episode because it's interesting they were willing to get into some of their kind of issues. And also, and I guess my bigger question for you is, Sam Harris has been so good on so many things. He, he's downright courageous in regard to October 7th in Israel. Yep. How do you judge somebody like that? All right. Um, so I haven't heard the episode. I, I'm not really surprised that they would go there. My sense of Sam Harris is he has so rationalized his position of free will that he's willing to challenge it in his own mind because it's so solid, solidly in some kind of loop that he can find excuses and find his way out of it no matter what. But I am, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to listen. I, I, I don't know if I can tolerate the first 45 minutes, but I might, I might skip ahead to the, to the other part. Um, it, it, so uh, he, he, there's a certain, it's not honesty exactly because he won't completely question his premises, but there's something there that I don't think, I don't think Sam Harris would, Constantly say to himself, no, no, I'm not going to ask the tough questions because that might change my mind. I mean, I, I think he he is willing to ask the tough questions. He's just got the answers to all of them because it, 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 he, he, you know, the whole thing is just so rationalized and it's so divorced from reality. Um, how do you judge him, God? I mean, you have to judge him as this deeply mixed case. First of all, you have to judge him as courageous. The guy is incredibly brave. He's incredibly courageous. And it's not only, I mean, what he did after 9-11 and what he did with the new atheists 
and and the way he went after Islam and then the way he went after religion was just spectacular. And it was well done and it was brave. And it was brave in the, in the, in the, in the face of real physical threats, not just hypotheticals, but real physical threats. And he took the right position on Islam and he, it, it was just it was just admirable. Um, and then I agree with you after October 7th, or to this day, his position on Israel, his position on the moral difference between the two. I don't know how there's morality if there's no free will. So I don't know how he <laughs> talks about that. And he, and, he, and he even has a talk on TED, like he has a TED talk, which is bridging the Izzard gap, where he, he says, you can derive morality from reality. Now, it's flawed and it's got problems with it and it's kind of circular, but but he's trying, right? He's trying to derive morality, even though he doesn't believe in free will. So he's, he completely loses it at some point. I, I wonder if they talked about that in the as one of the challenges they have. How can you have morality with no free will? Did they bring that up? No, no, they didn't go. No. I wish they would have. I, yeah, that would I, be I really swear, I want, to, I want to see you and Ankar locked in a room with Sapolsky yeah. and Harris until you iron that out. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I was curious because I, within the community, the objectivist community, I get people when I will post what I found interesting about these conversations who say, no, 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 he's evil to the core because he's evading reality. And there's something wrong with you, Robert, for caring about this or for keeping that discussion yeah. going. Yeah, I mean, if you if that were the case, you couldn't listen to anybody. You couldn't gain value from anybody. You can and, and not look, I, I wanted to emphasize some other things about Sam House. Sam has been courageous in other dimensions as well. He is incredibly consistently anti-Trump in 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 a in a in a rational kind of thoughtful way that I think I mean sometimes he gets irrational and unthoughtful but mostly rational. He has a fantastic episode on guns, right, which pissed off the left, right, where where he talks about the value of having gun gun ownership and so on. But he just the way he analyzes, he just does it so rationally, so clearly. And and you know, so he'll take a topic often and just do the best presentation on that topic that I've heard anyway. So no, I'm I have to say, in many respects, I'm a I'm a fan. I, I think he's amazing. And it, it drives me nuts that somebody could be that compartmentalized because as soon as he talks about psychedelics and about free will, he's completely lost the thread. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He, he, he's a complete idiot. And when he talks about capitalism, he's a complete idiot. But when he talks about things like guns and when he talks about things like Trump and when he talks about Islam and when he talks about Israel, he's amazingly good. And I consider him in those. So how do I judge him? He's a mixed case. He's a mixed case of massive evasion and rationalization and amazing capacity to reason through a problem um, and and to think it through and exhibit all the things that he denies exist, like free will, which is necessary for that reasoning capability. So um, what about your own the aspect from he evades objectivism? Everybody evades objectivism. I mean, <laughs> you don't. I mean, well, what am I going to do? Yeah, they, but wait, wait. I'm going to write the entire he, human race off because they evade objectivism. No, but he's particularly able to well, look at it and and choose to evaluate it. He has the brain to do it. He has the intellectual curiosity to do it, and so he bad. turns it off when so it comes bad. to He's an evader. He's an evader and a rational and 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 and, and a rationalist. Okay, but that goes with the free will, and that goes with the with the uh, drugs, and and he sees objectivism as a threat because he's 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 built up in his own mind this whole rationalistic view about free will and about life and about the world. Um, I also don't know who he's had, what his experiences with objectivism have been like. I mean, I, I sometimes worry about some of these guys meeting some noxious objectivists. And they kind of write off the whole thing because they met some me when I was 18 or something. No, I mean, but somebody really obnoxious and, and, um, you know, and, and therefore writing it off. So, yeah, you know, so you have to judge him as really, really mixed. But I mean, everybody's smart in the world out there, all the scientists and there are a lot of philosophers that, that should understand objectivism better. 
should, if they, when they read Ayn Rand, get it. And a lot of them do read Ayn Rand and they don't. And it's just blank. So you can't just, just rule them all out and say. Yeah. I appreciate that, Yaren, because he is a mixed case. And some people will read an essay like The Cult of Moral Grayness. And when she gets to the end and talks about complex cases where you really need to pick out, well, what is the black? What is the white? And some, some people still seem to take that as, oh, well, you're giving him a sanction. And it's no, I know what I criticize Harrison for and what I don't. But uh, yeah, that latest conversation is worth listening to. And it's it's good to know I'm not the only one who says, yeah, he's, he's good and he's bad, but he's good. No, and I, I enjoy listening to him on some issues, and he drives me nuts on others. Yeah, and and that's the reality. And and you know, I I think he's better than Jordan Peterson, let's say, right? So, even though I don't know if you heard my announcement, but all right uh, about Jordan Peterson. So, um, let's see. All right, let's quickly do some super chats. I do have a. Kind of a hard stop today, so I, I, we do have some limitations on time today. But let's do some of the super chats, and then we'll go back. Uh, and uh, all right, I'll do the couple of fifty dollar ones. Uh, Michael, you notice how parents constantly brag about how smart and amazing their kids are? That that is an altruism. It's a often a form of not insecure narcissism. They're letting out. That's right. What's screwing people up isn't just altruism, but improper rejecting altruism. But that's exactly the point, Michael, that, and that's what I keep emphasizing. They become narcissists because they're rejecting of the rejection of narciss of altruism. Altruism is what sets them up as narcissists, but it's always altruism. Altruism is what is driving this behavior, and they will all often feel guilty in different ways about. The, you know, uh, the different aspect of their narcissism. So they'll do things in other realms in their life to be out, to show their altruistic credentials. Um, so, um, no, it, it's all driven by altruism, even their narcissism, which you say, it's an improper rejection of altruism. Yes, but it's, it, it's, it, they're not offered an alternative because one of the reasons they can't go the self-interested route, the egoistic route is because narcissism blocks that eliminates that and and doesn't make that possible so what you're stuck with is either being altruist or be some kind of hedonistic narcissistic uh uh, uh you know uh, uh person uh, you, you, or, or pragmatist you're stuck with all these alternatives but self-interest egoism Altruism, the one thing altruism is very effective at doing is ruling that completely out of the way you think about the world and the way you think about reality. All right, Hopper Campbell, Hopper Campbell also uh, $50. I noticed leftists get especially nasty towards PhDs who are on the right. They come at you with moral intimidation. If you're sophisticated enough to get a PhD, you should be enlightened enough to reject selfishness and capitalism. I actually haven't noticed that. So I don't know where you've noticed that. I, I'm not challenging that. It's It makes sense to me. I've never been challenged by that, maybe because I don't make a big deal out of my PhD. But um, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it, 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 it makes sense. They, they think that they're the smart ones. They think they have most of the PhDs are lefties and they think they dominate it and they think only stupid people I mean, they literally think this. They think that only stupid people uh, can be uh, pro-capitalism, and therefore, and therefore, uh, they are shocked that somebody who's not stupid is pro-capitalism. Uh, that surprises them, and so it doesn't surprise me that they reject um, uh, anybody with a with a kind of a, a PhD. A PhD. Adri, forty eight dollars. Thank you, Adri. Uh, he says, "I like the YBS." Thank you, Adri. Appreciate it. And that was. Adri's first super chat. So thank you. Uh, James, I don't think the regulate big tech crowd is going to go anywhere. The digital world is just too sophisticated. It isn't like a factory, which is simple to impose controls over. Um, I'm trying to understand the question. I don't think the regulate big tech crowd is going to go anywhere. I don't think so either. They're going to stick around. The digital world is just too sophisticated. Uh, yeah, they're going to keep trying to regulate it. They're going to keep coming to, up with new ideas to regulate it uh, in spite of the sophistication of the digital world. 
uh, the digital world will keep finding ways around the regulation and new regulation will be imposed in order to clamp down and control it. And that challenge will keep going on just like it goes on in finance. They regulate finance and the financial markets finds ways around the regulation. And then they regulate the new ways around the regulation. And then, and it just, it's an ongoing, think about the wasted brain power resources capital that goes into finding ways around regulation instead of finding ways on how to be more productive and how to create more wealth. All right, Liam, you might feel frustrated that our movement is going slowly, but what's your what you're doing is working. I appreciate that, Liam. It certainly is working on kind of one mind at a time. There's no question. It's just the millions of mind at a time. I I, I haven't got a I haven't got a I haven't found the formula for the million minds at a time. I've I've, I've got it down to one mind at a time. That's going to have to satisfy. Uh, Hopper Campbell says thoughts on UFC President Dana White. He was on Lex the other day. He ended the show by saying to the effect he hates having to sleep. Uh, eight hours a day. He loves life so much. He wants it to be a 24 hour event. I mean, that's a great statement. I don't really know Dana White. I'm not a fan of UFC. I know a lot of objectivists love UFC and love fighting. He loves Trump. He loves Trump. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, 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 I, 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 I mean, to me, the bigger thing against him is that he's UFC president, but, but I, you know, I'm not big on fighting. I, 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 I don't like the idea of physical force um, as a sport, a physical force against another human being and really trying to hurt them. Um, uh, you know, so like an, the Olympic sport of wrestling, you get a sense that they're not hurting each other. It's more about technique, but there's no real hurt. There's no blood. I'm not a fan of boxing. I'm not a fan of, of, of you know, all you know, uh, a cage fights, the whole idea of a cage fight belongs in uh, Mad Max, right? Uh, and and not in not, not in a civilized society. So anyway, I, I, I know I'm pissing off a bunch of people, but uh, that is my opinion. And so I, I, I don't know that I could relate to Dana White. I appreciate this idea that you want to use every second of the day and you don't want to sleep. I certainly have that attitude, although Atiyah and others have convinced me that I need eight hours, whether I like it or not. And my other hours are going to be more productive if I get them. Although I, I find it almost impossible to actually sleep eight hours. Um, I wake up too often during the night to actually get eight hours of sleep, almost ever. Clark, if you cannot achieve equality of performance among people born to the same parents and raised under the same roof, how realistic is it to expect to achieve it across border and deeper society divisions? Zero. There's zero probability of that. That cannot happen, will not happen, not achievable. It goes against the metaphysical nature of reality and the metaphysical nature of mankind. So it can't happen. That doodle bunny, uh, we live in a world where the truth has to be explained again and again while a lie is believed immediately. How can this be? Uh, partially because uh, the people telling the lies are the people who are supposed to be telling us the truth. That is that the people who tell us the lies are the uh, the intellectuals, the people who are responsible for uh, helping us discover truth and, and figure out what is true and what is not. And we rely on them, like it or not, we rely on them uh, for our knowledge. Uh, so people follow the intellectuals. People don't have the time. Some of them don't have the just the sheer intelligence to discover truth by themselves. So it, 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 they're very much dependent on the intellectuals. When the intellectual betray you, it's very, very difficult to recover from that. It's very, very difficult to recover from that. So, um, you know, uh, therefore, when the intellectuals repeat a lie over and over and over and over again, people just accept it because they don't have the ability and the resources to go figure out that it's not true. Sad as that may be. All right, let us return to the panel. I'll just mention this before we return to the panel uh, because we got a lot more people listening right now than we did before. Uh, I'm, 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 um, I've been invited to do to teach a class, a couple of classes actually, for the Peterson Academy, Jordan Peterson's new online thing, uh, university, whatever. Not a real university, but it's an online educational platform. Uh, and uh, you know, you can attend. Uh, as as part of the live audience, these things have a live audience. So, um, and this is not about building coalitions at all. There is no coalition possible, but it is about teaching and it is about spreading the word. So, um, 
if anybody's interested in, in coming and attending and being in the audience while I talk about the niche of capitalism, um, then uh, uh, please consider applying to be a member, to buy, applying to be in the audience. You can go to petersonacademy.com slash, uh, slash book, petersonacademy.com slash book. Uh, and uh, it's April 30th to May 2nd, 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. I, I, you might have to come to all three, maybe only, you know, you might be able to come just for a day. You have to fill out the application to find out. But uh, it would be great if um, if uh, we had some of you there. It would be that would be cool. So um, you can, uh, yeah, you can come and have asked me live. No, I mean they have very stringent behavioral requirements. So there's only there's certain things you have to agree to behave in a certain way. These things are taped, high production value, and they want a certain aesthetic to it. Uh, so audience participation is very limited. It's mainly me just talking. All right. But uh, there will be some audience interaction with some Q&As. All right, let's jump to our panel. Uh, let's see, where are we? Um, uh, let's start with Alexander. Sure. Um, I have a, a quick comment and a, um, a question. Yep. One of your episodes going back a couple months, uh, you were saying, hey, I'm interested in doing a culture war and cultural show. I just wanted to say that I'm all in favor of that, you know, it'd be great to get like a focus show. And you stated in that episode that the Republicans have lost their culture war and that they're now trying to use the power of, you know, fiat and, you know, dictate to really instill their values in the society. So I just wanted you to elaborate on that a little more. And also, can you just um, bring more examples of culture wars, how they were fought and, um, you know, won or lost? Um, yeah, I mean, again, a big topic, but, um, look, Republicans, look, they, they lost their struggle against, um, uh, against gay marriage and against treating homosexuality as in, in, in some sense as normal. They lost that, right. They lost it big time. They lost really the hearts and minds of people around abortion. They lost a cultural battle around abortion. So, 65% of Americans, almost 70% are uh, supportive of abortion, at least uh, some uh, access to abortion, or pretty extensive access to abortion, uh, and, and something like 80% some access to abortion. It's a very small minority that believe there should be no abortion, period, uh, everything. Um, and they, they've lost complete control of the universities. They've, they've lost control of the cultural institutions in a sense of think about museums, um, uh, schools and everything like that so that, uh, you know, and, and this is not good. Those other issues, it's good that they lost. These other ones, it's not good that they lost. It's bad that the guys who won won, right? So, uh, you, you know, there's a lot out there that is very, um, uh, that is very non-conservative. You know, they've even lost the battle for how we dress and how we dress for work and 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 how we you know we are a much more casual culture than we were even 30 years ago never mind that we were 70 years ago so in that sense it, we've become less conservative in a sense of conserving they've lost the battle over sex i'm sure premarital sex is probably at at all time record highs i hope so um so so you know those are the things the kind of things that they have lost uh, again, the left has won most of those. And again, some of it's really bad that the left won the, the whole woke issue um, and, and all of that. Although I think on the things the left is wacky on, I think they're ultimately going to lose. And there's the, the significant signs that Americans will not accept woke, DI, uh, and and a lot of the, the, the racism, the anti-racism, uh, I think is the left is the American people are going to ultimately reject other culture wars. I mean, look, the biggest culture war was the Enlightenment, and uh, the Enlightenment was a culture war against uh, uh, Christianity, against a culture uh, where individuals had no say in their life, uh, a culture in which religion and family dictated all, um, a, a, a culture where uh, sex was basically you know, at least uh, as a as a um, was something that 
morality had it was very severe about and uh i think that changed it took a long time to change but it changed um the role of women in society um was was part of the big culture change the the the, the fact that women it, it were not stuck at home and just having kids and and so on and that that was of course the the, the big issue in the 18th century and then became more so in the 19th until it, it, women were completely emancipated in the 20th of course, slavery, think about the cultural war against slavery, which started in Europe in, again, the, 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 the 18th century, was in America in the 18th century, and then, of course, we fought a civil war over. So, uh, I mean, there's a sense in which all the good stuff that the culture's done uh, to, uh, to defeat the conservatives is still the Enlightenment. That is still the momentum of the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment is responsible for these good um, uh, cultural changes. But you can also think about bad cultural changes, the, the change from Greece, Rome, to Christianity, to a dark ages, a, a shutting down of the mind, a shutting down of individual behavior in a, a regimentation and collectivization uh, of the world. So I think those are some examples, but all of human history uh, of the West is this closing and opening of different cultural attitudes and, and, and yeah. your own, your answer really integrated to me that what's his name? Michael Knowles wants to go back to before the enlightenment. Yeah. yeah. He thinks it's better. That That's, I mean, if you, if you look even, even at Jordan Peterson, uh, he will sometimes say positive things about the enlightenment, but ultimately he and so many other conservatives associate the enlightenment with the woke left today. So it's a alignment led to the woke left. They blame Thomas Jefferson for the woke left. So they associate the alignment with rabid subjectivism and they, they, they don't get it. They don't get the way in which the alignment is based on reason and they don't get how reason is connected to reality. That's Kant's fault. And, and they don't get what reality really is in terms of how, how it, how reason works. Right. So, um, so yes, what the conservatives really want, what they really want to conserve is the pre-enlightenment world. Right. And and you see that what it was a Tucker Carlson complaining about modern architecture and and rev all, all the people on, online revering cathedrals and uh and condemning modern architecture. And yeah, they want to go back to the cathedral. They want to go back to pre-enlightenment they want to go back to pre-individualism uh where, where people were forced to fund and work on building cathedrals that were that made them look small and made them look insignificant and and the the, the denunciation the repudiation of the individual which is what the pre-enlightenment world was all about thanks alexander good question thank you thank you steve one of the things i've been I guess personally, as I haven't been able to care very much about a lot of the objectivist applications to kind of like politics or kind of like the larger economy. Like an example would be like um, it'd be interesting to talk about, or it's like somewhat interesting to talk about a world without a Federal Reserve. I just like when it comes to like if you work in finance, like the Federal Reserve is going to be a part of your life whether you like it or. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Or not. Um, I guess how do you think about like the split between like these two worlds? Because on like one hand, like, okay, yes, I mean, we'd like to move in this direction of like the, a more ideal world than we live in, but I have to like go do the things that I have to do. And that requires like like a reality orientation is useful, but like part part of that reality is like. Like whether I like it or not, like in machine learning, the government is going to regulate. And now we're only really negotiating how that's going to happen and what exactly that is going to look like. Like the whether it is going to happen or not has like already sailed. Whether that ship's already sailed. So like, how do you think about these kind of things? Well, I mean, I, I mean, you really have to, look, you deal with the reality as it is. You have to, you cannot be successful otherwise. And that's what reason requires it requires you and what egoism requires is you have to deal with the world as it is and you have to make the most of the world as it is in, in, in if you're in finance the federal reserve is there and and 
it'll screw you once in a while and its existence will piss you off periodically. But you have to take that into account in any decisions you make. And if you're not, if you don't, you're not being rational and and, and you're, you're subverting your own mind. You're subverting your own existence. And, you know, but but also holding that it shouldn't exist and it shouldn't be like that is how you maintain your sanity, right? It's how you maintain your sanity when you see the Federal Reserve doing stupid things or ridiculous, absurd stuff that might affect you in a bad way or or or, or or not, but but you, you so you, you and and so you've got to hold both at the same time, which is harder, right? If we lived in a perfect world, in a less capitalist world, life would be easier. There's no question, life would be easier. We'd have so much more mental space just to focus on succeeding at life. And now we have to deal with the bullshit, and we have to deal with holding perspective and holding what our ideal is, and living in this reality, and dealing with all the. The, the 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 bogus stuff that happens on a on a regular basis and it makes it harder because you have to juggle too many things it just it, and you just have that's just something you just have to accept because there's just no alternative you can't there's no you can't escape to the alternative universe it's not there yeah i feel like i've accept, i maybe i've accepted it too much like one of the things is like i've had like i've had a very hard time getting upset about like almost anything. Like when they were talking about student loans, like being forgiven, a bunch of my friends were all wild up and I'm like, guys, it's a trillion dollars, no one cares. If it's not this trillion, it'll be another trillion. Like <laughs> the trillion's gonna get spent. Yeah, like, but the, the point is not to care about every specific thing because that'll drive you nuts, right? Because you, you, you will devote too much mental energy to it. But that's the point. The point is you do care, right? When you're saying a trillion this, a trillion that, that you caring, that you saying, this is crazy. You know, I, I'm not going to get delve into that rabbit hole of this specific, like some objectivists do is like they find some issue and then they go down the rabbit hole and they can analyze everything and they, you, you lose track of, no, I mean, it's just one little thing. Look at everything that they're doing is, is crappy. So you have to hold that, but don't forget what your ideals require. Don't forget the kind of world you want to live in. Because uh, because it 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 it'll I think it'll grind you down if you don't hold that in in some way. Um, if if you you know this is why I think people read Atlas Shrugged every few years because they need that they need to bring it to consciousness every once in a while. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we, so so we need to remind ourselves that that of what the ideal is to stay sane in the world in which we live. I think. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Stay sane. <laughs> Adam. Uh, yes. Why is it that bad news about California circulates fast and then when it turns out to be um, either insubstantial or false, uh, Nobody knows about it. For example, there was a state panel on education uh, guidelines that dropped advanced algebra from the secondary school curriculum. Uh, and the next thing, the University of California and California State University, both of those are the main government university networks in California announced, don't pay attention to that. We are still requiring advanced algebra for admission to our universities. And that didn't make the news. Well, because first of all, I don't think it's that significant. Um, but secondly, look, California is now the model of a leftist state in, in everybody's mind. So the right will latch on to everything bad California does and make a big deal out of it, just like they do with with any anything that a, a red state does that is the model of kind of a conservative thing. But uh, so it gets a lot of resonance in the media when a bad things happen. And generally, good news is never reported. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when was the last time you saw in the news anything good? Um, but. You know, and, and the math thing is complicated. So, and that's also something news news don't like to report. So there is this recommendation 
by a, 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 these guidelines for mathematics that are official state policy, but they're not imposed, they're just guidelines. And some districts are accepting them, some districts are not. For years, San Francisco banned algebra for middle schools, but there's been a massive rebellion against that within San Francisco, particularly among Asians in San Francisco who are like, no, I want my kid to study algebra in eighth grade. Don't deny my kid that. And now San Francisco is reintroducing algebra in eighth grade, even though the guidelines from the state say don't teach algebra in eighth grade. So, but yeah, they, nobody has an incentive to report on the good news because the left doesn't have an incentive to report on it because they're not sure it's good or not, right? Because from their perspective, it's not clear that teaching algebra in eighth grade is a good thing because of egalitarianism. And the right's not going to report it because they want to make San Francisco look as crazy and insane as possible. Uh, it's the same thing about, you know, I've been fighting with people in the chat about crime, right? Uh, if you look at violent crime in America today, it, it's it's high. It's higher than it was in 2014, 2016. But it's much, much lower than it was two years ago. And it's quite a bit lower. It's, it's a lot lower than it was in the 90s and the 80s. But nobody wants to believe it because that upsets their particular view of the world. And nobody's going to report it. You have to go find find the data because nobody reports good news. Nobody reports the good stuff that's happening, right? Yeah, you know, um, so nobody has an incentive. Like uh, the Biden administration approved the, the recommissioning of this uh, nuclear power plant in Michigan. Like the right doesn't have an incentive to say that because that makes Biden look good. And the left doesn't have an, an incentive to say it because they're against nuclear power. So um, nobody has an incentive to actually promote a story like that. And you see it over and over and over again. Thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, let's see. Andrew. Yeah, um, I just actually asked Ben Bear this question. So I'm curious about your your take. Uh, on it. Oh, God. OK, there was a, there was an ARI roundtable before your show and. Um, he in his talk on Augustine brought up how like Augustine in his biography, he had stories that were like secondhanded and where he acted secondhanded. And I was curious if Ben was connecting mysticism with secondhandedness. So I, I, I want to ask you as well, like, do you do you view a connection there? Well, I'm sure there's a connection. Uh, I'm sure there's a connection between mysticism and secondhandedness, because at the end of the day, um, if you're if truthful lies on mysticism, on revelation, um, then most people don't get the revelation. The, you know, only the Pope gets the revelation, or only the theologians who understand the exact meaning of the uh you know what's the written word understand what it really says so most people have to accept stuff on on the basis of faith but what does that mean to accept stuff on the basis of faith faith doesn't just boom, just introduce itself into your consciousness it means they have to accept it based on somebody else's word they have to accept it because somebody else told them so they have to accept it because some expert suggested it, and that's second-handedness, right? They have to do it. Uh, they, they they have to do it from the. Uh, there's no other way for them to. Uh, how do they know mm -hmm. what this passage in the Bible says other than an authority told them so? Yeah, right. I mean, he uh, basically he. In essence, I think what you're saying agrees with him because he he basically said that. Augustine was was telling stories about subordinating his minds to the his mind to the judgment of others. Yeah, which well, is yeah. Mis, which is a mystic, you know, a basis for mysticism. Yeah, he had to because the reality is that um, Augustine says the church is always right. The church is the truth. The church is the truth, not God. The church, i.e. the Pope, i.e. the Catholic Church, has dogma, and that dogma is the truth. 
even if I don't quite understand it, even if I don't quite get it, doesn't matter. It is the truth. That's inherently second-handed. That establishes second-handed as the way in which the church has to be. Got it. Thanks, Andrew. I'm glad Ben and I are on the same page. Skyler. Yes, sir. Uh, as April 15th fast approaches and people are have the deadline for paying and filing their taxes, I just wanted to know a simple question. Why is it six hundred dollars as the as the minimum amount for you to be taxed? And I think it goes along with minimum wage and licensing laws that disincentivize people from you know pursuing work. Is this is it from a bureaucrat's whim that it's six hundred dollars? So how, what do you mean six hundred dollars? If you make less than six hundred dollars, you don't have to pay taxes on it. No, no, it, it's the threshold for for being taxed. Six hundred dollars is the threshold. It's okay. a threshold for reporting your income on the form 299. I can I tell see. you as an accountant. So, and it is administrative oh. convenience. Thank you. Mostly so that it's easy. So otherwise the IRS does not want to receive 10 billion forms 1099 any given year. So they're only picking up, you know, the most egregious stuff and expensive stuff, but you have to report all of it. You know, the rules are we have a voluntary compliance system. Okay. You have to this, report all your income, six, even, right. 600. even if you never received the a form 1099, somebody forgot to send you one. Exactly. And the same, you know, rule $10 for the form 10, uh, 1099 INT, you know, for interest and dividends. Okay. So those limits are for administrative convenience. The IRS doesn't care about that because their computers are just going to be inundated with the whole bunch. That's that's the debate right now that we have with the new reporting on, you know, Zelle transfers and, and, and all of that stuff, because the limits have been dropped from, I think they used to be 20,000 or something absurd like that down to now they're going to five and they want it to be as low as 600. Yep. So whenever you send money to your grandma, you know, for whatever kitchen table you got from her, you'd have to report it on your schedule D and people are just like, this is going to be insane, you know? Yep. Yeah, thank it's you. It's just administrative convenience. <laughs> so, thank so, you. Uh, so, thank okay. you, uh, Alexander. Obviously, thank a tax you. accountant. Uh, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 more convenience than everything anything else. There are plenty of ways in which the tax system is trying to manipulate you and trying to disincentivize you to do certain things and not other things, like own a home and not rent. You get a tax deduction. Oh, and own a home with debt, not cash, because you get a tax deduction on your mortgage and. Yeah, you know, but but if you buy a car with with debt, you don't get a tax deduction on that. Uh, so there are all kinds of ways in which the tax system is trying to incentivize behavior. But I, I think the six hundred is just is just convenience. It, you know, that's why they hired eighty thousand new IRS agents. Although yeah. I think that number keeps getting cut down uh, because they're inundated with stuff. They can't keep up. Uh, they can't keep track of everything. Right? They still thank you, thank yeah. you both. Thank you both. <laughs> they still manage to make errors all the time. So they still manage to make mistakes all the time and um, and screw us over. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's do these uh, Super Chat questions quickly, and we'll, we'll call it a day. Thank you to the panel. Really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, let's see. Ed, uh, oh, I wanted to go and just say RDF, thank you for the uh, sticker. Wes, thank you. Really appreciate the sticker, Wes. Uh, Jonathan, thank you. And I think that's as far back as I can go. All right, uh, let's do these questions. Uh, Ed, has Leonard Peikoff said anything about his view on artificial intelligence since chat GPT? No, and I, and I doubt Leonard has used chat GPT or tried it out. I, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if that were the case. Uh, given his, you know, general aversion to tech, <laughs> put it that way. Um, that doodle bunny, is it possible to ignore the haters since they are everywhere? Yeah, it's impossible to ignore them. You you just have to place them in perspective and not, not let them get to you, right? Uh, not let them uh, uh, destroy your ability to live your life and you live your life well. Um, Michael continued, that was my point from yesterday. Not that I'm saying altruism isn't fundamentally widespread evil. Okay. So yes, I, you know, I agree with you altruism. And I've said this on, uh, many, many times on the show. Altruism doesn't manifest itself as I need a sacrifice. I need to constantly sacrifice for other people. I need it. I mean, it, it does in mother Teresa 
and maybe a few other people. But in 99% of the time, it doesn't manifest itself that way. It primarily manifests itself in ways where people are trying to, either through guilt or people trying to, you know, live their life somehow and uh, without the altruism. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, narcissism, hedonism, pragmatism, all these other ways as a rejection of. So absolutely. But the background is always altruism. The thing that is driving them is always altruism. Uh, Jake, uh, thank you, Yaron. You're helping the window cleaning day go by faster here in Colorado. Thank you from Andrew and Jake. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jake. And uh, yeah, uh, window cleaning is uh, is good, particularly in Colorado. We have beautiful views. Uh, Gail says, I have wondered if the government let big tech have some freedom, just enough to keep them innovating so they can steal it for their purposes. I don't think that that conscious of what they're doing. I mean, if they were too, they would be, but I don't think they are. I, I don't think they're sophisticated enough. There's a sense in which that's true. I think there's a sense in which even they recognize, oh, well, if we really clamp down on it, we won't get innovation. We won't get increased GDP. There will be unemployment. We don't want that. But we still need to control them. But I, I don't think, I, I don't know how they hold it in their own minds, but it's definitely the case um, that they need the golden goose to lay the golden egg so that they can fund all their power lusting programs with so they don't they they're careful not to have the boiling fog jump out of the pan right they want to boil it slowly they will kill it at some point but they want to do it slowly robert said I had to jump off the panel to prep for a big saturday night with amy and friends thanks as always for the hard work answers and insights thank you robert really appreciate the support and uh, Mark says, greetings to you, Ron. And everyone on the panel, I'm interested in joining the next AMA. Would you guys recommend it? Also want to share an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free. Uh, you know, uh, I think you're, uh, Angela sends out the link uh, for it so you can uh, participate uh, next time. As long as you maintain above $25 a month, uh, you are eligible to participate. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the support. Jeremy uh, did another sticker for $10, and, and that is his 20th Super Chat. So for some reason, YouTube tells me 1, 3, 5, 10, and 20. Uh, some of you have well exceeded that, and it doesn't tell me by how much. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, I appreciate it. I hope um, uh, I hope you guys uh, go to einwand.org slash start here to apply for scholarship for Ocon. I hope you go to uh, Alex Epstein, Epstein, Alex Epstein, dot Substack dot com, and uh, subscribe to his Substack and subscribe to his uh, Alex AI app and everything else. Get his energy talking points, and I will see all the, those are sponsors. I will see you guys on Monday. Uh, probably do two shows on Monday, given the Tuesday is uh, I'm flying on Tuesday. I'll be on an airplane all day from six in the morning to 9 p.m. on my way to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, so two shows on Monday. I'll see you all there. Have a great weekend. Have a wonderful. Is it OK to say have a wonderful Easter? Friday was when they crucify him. Sunday is he comes back to life. So I guess it's it's cool. Resurrection Sunday. 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 What's that? I said Resurrection Sunday. That's what Resurrection Christian Sunday. Resurrection is cool. <laughs> I like Resurrection. All right. So, uh, so happy Easter to everybody. Go find those eggs and the bunnies and figure out. Here's a integration challenge for you. Integrate that with the Resurrection of Christ. Uh, that'll be your uh, your uh, uh, concept in a hat challenge for the day. Bye, everybody. Thanks for the support. Thanks our panel. Thanks all the super chatters. See you Monday. Bye.